Hey everyone, welcome back to the YouTube channel. In this video, I'm gonna talk about something that's super common in my practice, both as a intensivist and a cardiothoracic anesthesiologist, and that is hypotension. And I'm gonna talk about how I approach blood pressure in either low situations or even hypertension when patient's blood pressure is pretty high in a systematic way. I think it's really important to understand this because when you walk up to a patient and they're hypotensive, you can think about all the different things. Oh, do they need volume? Do they need pressors? Do they need ionotropes? What are their electrolytes doing? But when you start jumping around like that, you end up missing out on potential diagnoses. So we do a really good job of this in med school when we talk about the kidneys. We talk about a pre-renal, intrarenal, and post-renal situation. But if you apply that to any organ system, you're not going to miss anything. So when I'm talking about blood pressure with my residents and fellows, one thing I go back to is, is Ohm's law. So Ohm's law basically says uh, V equals IR. That's how it's mathematically uh, written out. But it's referring to a change in electrical pressure, AKA voltage between two points is equal to the flow of electrons between those two points, AKA current, and the resistance to flow, which is the resistance. So if you apply that to physiology, and in this case, systemic blood pressure, we're gonna say the mean arterial pressure, the MAP, is related to flow, which we're gonna say is cardiac output, times the resistance to flow, which in the systemic circuit is systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. So mathematically, cardiac output and SVR are the two primary determinants in your mean arterial pressure. Then you can break down cardiac output into, pre into heart rate and stroke volume, and the stroke volume could subsequently be broken down into preload, afterload, and contractility. So look at what we've done here. You've taken into consideration things before the heart, the preload, what's going into the heart. You've taken into consideration the afterload, the intrinsic resistance to forward flow leaving the heart. And then within the heart itself, intracardiac, you're looking at rate, contractility, and also you have to consider rhythm. Now rhythm, you can't really mathematically derive from that, but if you've got a patient who's got a tachyarrhythmia, like atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, you would think, oh great, the heart rate's fast, that's gonna increase my overall cardiac output. But keep in mind that the heart rate can be so fast, you've not given the ventricle enough time to fill during diastole. Typically, systolic times are more or less fixed, but as the heart rate increases and decreases, that affects your diastolic filling time, which is very important. If it gets too fast, you don't have enough time to fill the ventricle and your preload has been choked off. So the stroke volume you can eject forward has significantly been reduced. So in this situation, your stroke volume may fall disproportionately more than your heart rate is gonna be able to augment your cardiac output. So again, going back to the math, your mean arterial pressure, your MAP, is then related to your, your preload, your afterload, your contractility, your rate, and your rhythm. Those five things. And I always am thinking of these things, whether my patient's hypertensive or hypotensive. Do they need more volume? Do they need more squeeze? Do they need decreased afterload? Uh, you have to consider a lot of different things. Is there a valvular issue? Does the patient have significant mitral regurgitation or aortic stenosis that I have to worry about? Do they have acute right ventricular failure? Where if your patient's hypotensive and you're doing a bedside ultrasound and the left ventricle is empty, the knee jerk reflex is to give fluid. But in reality, giving fluid to someone whose right ventricle is not gonna mobilize that fluid is only gonna make things worse. They can't move that fluid from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. So in that case, I'm thinking something along the lines of epinephrine or dobutamine to help with mobilizing that fluid. And, and when you have things like echocardiography, PA catheters, arterial blood pressures, all these invasive monitors we talk about, and then even other tests that you can do like passive leg rays, uh, VTIs of outflow through the aortic valve, uh, these modalities come in very, very handy to look at the uh, overall clinical picture and put it together in terms of what does my patient need. But second of all, you've got to also think about the pretest probability of certain situations. If someone is coming in febrile, hypotensive, altered mental status, and they have a bacteremia, that's septic shock, that's vasodilatory shock, they probably will start on norepinephrine plus or minus vasopressin. I will consider other things, of course, but Common things being common, that septic shock. Someone coming off cardiopulmonary bypass who, when I look in the field, I don't see their right ventricle squeezing very much. I'm worried about RV failure, especially if this is like a fresh VAD implantation or a heart transplant. 
So I'm putting the clinical context at the forefront of how I approach hypertension and hypotension, but mathematically breaking it down the way that I did earlier in this video. So again, to summarize, if you consider your mean arterial pressure related to your preload, something before the heart, your afterload after the heart, and then intracardiac issues like contractility, rate, and rhythm, you won't miss anything. And whether the patient's got severe tricuspid regurge or they're coming in with septic shock, these things are usually multifactorial. So you can certainly need volume and inotropic support or vasodilatation with a little bit of squeeze. But if you go methodically like this, you won't miss anything. So if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe for more content. Drop me a comment below with questions and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Take care, everyone.